it's been my, my good fortune now for some 16 years to serve in the Senate with Senator Dick Luger and to come to know him and his wife, Shar, and more importantly, uh, to come to know their work together on behalf of Indiana and the United States. Dick Luger is truly a giant in the United States Senate. We're going to miss him. Hello, I'm Senator Dick Durbin. Welcome to my Capitol Report, A Different View. And today we're going to take a view from the Midwest on the world with a colleague of mine who'll be retiring very shortly, Dick Luger of Indiana. Dick, it's good to be with you today. Thank you, Dick. Great to be your guest. Well, you know, Governor Adley Stevenson once said that those of us who grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, living on all that flat land, had a different perspective as we looked out on the world. He was right. He was, <laughs> and you certainly have. I look back at your boyhood. You grew up in Indianapolis yes. or nearby, yes. right? Yes, Indianapolis. Well, what did your folks do? What was that all of? What was that like? My dad uh, was a farmer. He was a Purdue graduate in agriculture, and uh, I spent a lot of time, as did my brother Tom, a year younger, out on the farm pulling volunteer corn out of the soybean fields. But, ah. uh, it's a farm that I still have managed for the family for the last 50 years with 604 acres of corn and soybeans and hardwood trees. So that was here in his background. And my mother uh, was the daughter of a a pioneer in the food manufacturing business. Uh, the Thomas O. Green Company made uh, cookie and cracker production machinery with band ovens and cutting machines and what have you. And so this was an enterprise with a high school uh, diploma he founded and sold these machines all over the world. So it was a wonderful view of the world from two perspectives. Farming and business. Yes. And you found time in addition to going to school for the Boy Scouts, and literally yes, the Eagle Scouts. Well, that was very important. In those days, you had to be 12 years old, and my scoutmaster to be came by to visit with my parents, a very serious oh. endeavor about all the responsibilities and what was going to be involved. But it was a very good troop, and of course, troops often depend upon the quality of the adult leadership and its follow through. But I had a great experience in Brown County, the rural Indiana County, that in those days uh, had only running water, I think, on some occasions. <laughs> there were no lights that I can recall. So it was really a camping experience, to say the least. And you moved up the ranks to the highest rank in the Scouts, Eagle Scout. Yes, yes. Then to distinguished Eagle, and to cap all this, my lovely wife, Char, found all the merit badges, got them onto the, <laughs> the sash so we could put it in our office with various other uh, Eagle Scout distinctions. How many things. merit badges did you have? Well, I guess 21. Now, I think they're more required these days, but yeah. in those days, 21, and then we had an examination on all of those with the Eagle Corps oh, sure. review. Yeah. Really had to reenact my life-saving merit badge again, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> in the pool there at the Indianapolis Athletic Club. And, run the dashes and all this sort of thing, and we're taking nothing for granted. I wanted to do it by the time I got out of high, grade school, because I figured high school was going to be another chapter, and that turned out to be a good strategy. Your strategy beyond high school was to go to Denison University in Grand, Ohio. Granville, Ohio. Granville, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> I remember Tony Hall from the House of Representatives, yes. which a graduate, and was also an All-American football player, and Denison was known in his day as the I guess one of the last colleges with the single wing football formation. Yes, yes. Well, that's true. And we had Woody Hayes as our coach at Denison for a while. He moved over to Ohio State uh, to a much more noted or notorious <laughs> situation, <laughs> as, depending on. But Denison, uh, folks in the stands would be, have their radios on listening to Woody in Ohio State. <laughs> it was not a minor sport, but nevertheless, it had its place. But the big, <laughs> big news at Denison is when you were not just elected president, but co-president yes, of co -president. the student body, yes. and a young co-ed named Charlene, yes. whom you came to call Char, yes. was your co-president, and pretty soon more than that, right? Well, that was the most important <laughs> election I was ever involved in. <laughs> it was a very progressive school, an election of a man and a woman, and then the two elected by the total student body came together as co-presidents. And so I, without telling tales out of school, would just say that uh, Shar had told uh, some classmates that uh, she was not about to be pushed around by some pushy man. I said, me? I say, but I realized diplomacy. 
was uh, ah, really your first fun. test of diplomacy. Exactly. How did that work out with when this I Charlene? I took her down to the coffee shop in <laughs> downtown Granville, and uh, thus a romance ensued. Uh, at the time, I had given my fraternity pen to a younger woman. She had accepted a fraternity pen from an older man. Oh, oh. <clears throat> but uh, these two, sadly enough, uh, disappeared from our <laughs> lives. And, uh, we've been married 56 years. 56 years. And have had just a, a wonderful time with our four sons, now our 13 grandchildren. It's a, a great life. So off you are uh, in the farming business and, and growing some trees and yes. a little business work, and somebody says, Dick Luger, why don't you run for mayor of Indianapolis? Well, it, it came about that when I was out at the factory trying to save this family business, because my dad had passed away prematurely. My brother was a Purdue engineer. I was just simply a liberal arts type, politics, philosophy, economics. But nevertheless, the two of us managed to turn this thing around, begin to make some money, and it was largely through exports. Uh, in Mexico, Venezuela, finally the Philippines. So it was quite an interesting situation. <clears throat> but uh, people on the west side of Indianapolis, pardon me, <clears throat> the industrial side of, of the city, came to the factory one day <clears throat> and said, Luger, you gotta run for the school board. Uh, we're just getting dirt. Our kids are, are never treated right. And somebody's gotta stand up for us. Now, mind you, I was 31 years of age. Uh, I was trying to keep a struggling factory going out there, <clears throat> totally unaware of even where the school board met, quite apart from exactly what they did. But nevertheless, uh, the urgency of this was apparent, and Char, always a good conscience, said, you know, our boys will be going into public schools very soon. Maybe this is something we'll look at. So I got into it. I didn't realize a civil rights revolution was just commencing at that point. All sorts of candidates came into the field and <clears throat> made a long story short, I was elected in sort of an at-large situation and got into one controversy after another, starting with school breakfast. The Chamber of Commerce said, we've never accepted a dime in this town from the federal government, and we're not about to start now, Luger, because you've got some ridiculous idea about breakfast for <laughs> latchkey children or something of this sort. But nevertheless, I, I prevailed, the children got the breakfast, and then we... So was this one of your first radical ideas, breakfast for oh, kids at school? It, it was just off the charts. You know, this news editorialized, and <laughs> we're still, I began to think about peaceful desegregation of the public schools, which is even more of a reach, yeah. and adopted the so-called short-reach plan, named after the high school I had attended, that uh, had, was now 90% African-American, 10% Caucasian. When I was there, it was 100% Caucasian. So in any event, uh, we, we adopted a situation that any child all over the, the city could come to short reach for a college preparatory situation. Uh, no boundaries, no nothing. So the first freshman year, the miracle happened, 50% Caucasian, 50% African American, like water going uphill. The educational journals all over the country noted it, but it was too good to be true. <laughs> uh, more post-conservative members came onto the school board and uh, said, uh, we're just for education. We're not sociologists and we're not involved in race relations. So, so rapidly things deteriorated again and Indianapolis went the way of most cities. Mm -hmm. A desegregation order ultimately in the federal court, busing of children and all the rest. But for, a, for a while there were some golden moments in which uh, people really thought about education, uh, thought uh, really about justice and equality likewise. So after all that, was running for mayor a relief from the school board? Well, I would never have thought about running for mayor if I had not been involved in all of this, nor would anyone else have thought about my running for mayor. Mm -hmm. But the, the controversies were so enormous. No Republican had won in Indianapolis for over 20 years and unlikely ever to do so again, given the demographics at the time. But the Republicans uh, decided this would be an interesting <laughs> candidacy. And uh, so I won, barely, over the incumbent mayor. And thus began the idea of UNIGOV, the idea we were going to have the city and the surrounding county, Marion County, in one city with one mayor, one council, and all the wealth uh, of... Uh, and uh, so that, of course, was quite a controversy, to say the least. <laughs> of all the things you've done, Dick Luger, that's the one that just absolutely astounds me. When I think of Illinois loaded with all forms of government, yes. 
I, I can't even tell you all the different forms of government. I think we may lead the nation. When you threaten one of those forms of government, boy, you are in yeah. for the battle royal. But you managed in Indianapolis to basically combine a county into yes. a single form of and government? Therefore, we came up into one of the largest ten cities in the country suddenly. We had a, a huge uh, pouring of investment to come in. This was the beginning of professional sports in a big way. Yeah. That uh, we were really on the map. And uh, at the same time, however, uh, just using the sort of data we all look at here and now, uh, about 35% of the public if asked, do you approve of Dick Luger or disapprove? <laughs> about the 35 on the disapprove didn't change for Never changed. most of the time. Very, so, very unhappy. <laughs> I want to ask you a couple uh, Indianapolis-related questions uh, that are just kind of curious what comes to your mind. Uh, first, what the heck's a Hoosier, Dick Luger? Can you tell us on the record, what's a Hoosier? No, I can't tell you. <laughs> no one you, knows. You know, well, you've been asking that question probably for 50 years. <laughs> The old adage, however, that sort of fits is that the settler uh, heard a knocking at the door and he said, who's there? <laughs> that's as close as it gets. Yes, that's, that's okay. close. <laughs> so now let me ask you, what, what is your, uh, when you think about the movie Hoosiers, mm -hmm. about that famous little yes. basketball team that yes. won the state championship playing yes. the big school, mm -hmm. and if I remember correctly, our former member in Congress from Indiana was playing on the big school team, Hamilton, wasn't yes. he? Lee Hamilton yes. yeah. played on the team, the little school won. What is your impression or memory of that, uh, if oh, you have I, one? Oh, I remember all of it vividly, and of course the film was just a knockout. It was Because great. it was Butterfield House, where uh, I was a short reach high school player, not a very good one. Uh, but that's where we played the sectionals, and then they had the regionals, the semifinals, and the finals, all there. And so that a very historic situation. And furthermore, Milan, which was the small town that had this team, was just the epitome of what Hoosier basketball was all about. Namely, in those days, you had 700 high schools. They all entered a tournament. Uh, and uh, so you went through the 64 sectionals and the regionals and semifinals. And at the end of the day, and the idea was always the hope that a giant killer would come along. We have know. the same stories in Illinois. <laughs> Nowadays, um, and it may be for good reason, but educational authorities have decided that um, perhaps uh, self-enhancement is more important for children than all this business of Hoosier basketball. Yeah. So we have four classifications. Yeah, it's it's all segmented. Same. And unfortunately, the attendance at many gyms is pretty low yeah. uh, and the interest of, of the fans. So what is your memory of the Indianapolis 500? We all, the whole world is, has oh its eye focused yes. on Indianapolis for that Memorial Day race yes. each year. And as I've dr driven through there, I know that big parts of the town are focused, as they should be, on this internationally famous race. What's your memory of the Indianapolis 500? Oh, several. One, one is I invited all the mayors of the world to come to Indianapolis one time for an international conference on cities. And a lot came and some stayed for the race. So we were all seated uh, on, uh, on the stretch there where the cars come in, uh, and one car came in too fast and came right over and hit down the poles that held together the press situation. The photographers kept tumbling out, and just, <laughs> just a fiasco, <laughs> all for the world to see these folks. Uh, another time we were in a period in which the streaking was very popular. And uh, this didn't happen during the race itself, but during the qualifications, uh, we had several incidents in which persons having dispensed with all of their clothes sprinted down the straightaway, chased by police <laughs> who, who were no, not contenders, they weren't fast enough <laughs> to catch these. Things. So on, on race day, um, our family always sat in a particular box that reserved for the mayor, and we were overlooking a stretch, and it looked to me like there were a number of suspicious people that, you know, given any opportunity, and the police had the same idea. But fortunately, the race went on and on and on. People didn't want to get in the middle of the track in the middle of the but As soon as it was over, why, these people all headed for the track, and the police headed right after them, and it was no contest. No contest. <laughs> <laughs> Two races on one day. Yes. And so the time came when it was time for you to move on up uh, to the United States Senate. And uh, how did that invitation, how was that presented? Well, the first invitation came during 1974. This, as you recall, was a very difficult year for President Richard Nixon. 
to say the least. And a very difficult year for Indiana Republicans as they took polls uh, as to who would run against Senator Birch by. Uh, everyone did very badly. Uh, I did the least badly. I was only eight points behind in the initial poll. And so they said, well, you have to run. We know you want to wait around for a better contest. And you are still mayor, but at the same time, you've got to do it for the party and for the country and whatever. So in any event, I, I did so. Things got worse. Uh, by the time uh, summertime came and the fairs, I was down 16 points. And I thought, oh, this is a disaster. But then President Nixon resigned, as you recall. Mm -hmm. So he went through a period in August, and suddenly the polls came up to even. I said, this is miraculous. This is going to happen after all, even though uh, no one ever anticipated it. Not so. President Ford pardoned President Nixon, down 13 points. <laughs> we finally lost by four. But the experience was such that I gained statewide recognition, and people had a, a good impression. So the next race against Senator Vance Harkey, who had, had served three terms, was a fairly easy race. That would have been 76. Six, yes. I see. Uh, and um, a much more pleasant time. Yeah. So. One of the things that uh, I noted on the floor when we talked about your service here was your involvement in so many important issues relative to world peace. And I made a note of the fact that you invited a brand new senator from Illinois named Barack Obama on a congressional trip uh, to take a look at the nuclear proliferation issue firsthand. Yes. And it had a profound impact on him. He talked about it f uh, as soon as he returned and for many years after. What do you remember about that trip? Well, I remember that Senator Obama really was a very faithful member of the Foreign Relations Committee. He was the last Democrat. And, and when we went back and forth with our question and answer, it was often two hours or so before we got uh, to the senator. Sometimes we were the only two left at this point. And so I, I was really pleased when he asked, uh, when the summertime came, he said, Dick, I know you go to Russia every year, and I'd like to go along with you this year. So I said, well, that's, that'll be great. So in any event, uh, after a short stay in Moscow, after all it was August and all the authorities were gone, we did see some labs with some other dire chemicals in them mm -hmm. and so forth. We went out uh, uh, to a, a, a place in mid-Russia, uh, and um, there we took a look at how we d disassembled some missiles that had been on uh, trains and all that sort of thing. but. Um, same time, the people there were so pleased, they said, let's come back to the airport and celebrate, and they laid out caviar and vodka. And after uh, an hour of this, I thought we had celebrated perhaps sufficiently, um, but we found we were not going to go anywhere, that we were going to be held at this airport uh -huh. uh, for reasons we could not imagine. But uh, later I learned that Russians felt that I was a spy, and that as a matter of fact, they wanted to examine the planes, these uh, young, uh, enlisted personnel that are on the planes to guard them were resisting that, unfortunately. Um, and so we were going nowhere. It was Sunday afternoon. Staff had cell phones. They couldn't get anybody at the State Department, the Defense Department, any place. But um, uh, Brock was very calm about it. I said, this is cool. I'll take a nap. This could last for a while, you know. But what a, a tough initiation for your first trip to Russia. But <laughs> well, you, you took him to Russia, and it, it's something he didn't forget. And it was on an issue which really you and Sam Nunn, the former senator from Georgia, have made a name for yourselves that will go down in history. Because as the Soviet Union declined, the question remained, what would happen to those thousands of nuclear warheads in this unstable political situation yes. in Russia, as well as this unstable economy uh, would they maintain them? What was the threat to the world? And I think you and Sam Nunn stepped up in a way that uh, will be recognized in history as having saved us from some possible calamities. Uh, as you look back, is that your proudest accomplishment in the Senate? Yes, it is, because it's such an extraordinary, historically counterintuitive situation. Already, uh, President Gorbachev and President Reagan had talked about ridding the world of nuclear weapons, but not come to agreement at Reykjavik or other times of that variety. One of some of the Russians that Sam and I had met when we went to Geneva, Switzerland, at the behest of President Reagan, to get ready for a treaty, you know, the two-thirds vote in the Senate and have a bipartisan group. In any event, some of these Russians came, I can remember vividly, sitting around a round table in Sam's office, which I had wheeled down to my office after he left uh, for historical purposes. Uh, they said, we're bankrupt. 
and uh, we've got officers that are deserting. And as a matter of fact, uh, you folks spent trillions of dollars trying to contain this all this time. But at this point, we're both going to lose it because there it will not be sufficient security. So we need your money. Uh, we need your uh, personnel that uh, are technical. And we may need your, your troops, for that matter. But uh, you, you've got to act and act fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that a superpower like Russia, two countries talking about mutually assured destruction for 40 years without really realizing what that would mean, suddenly one of them comes and says, we need your money, and we need it fast. And, this, and you're, uh, So that was the beginning of the Non-Luger Act. And um, things then moved uh, in our country. There was always skepticism about this. On the Senate debate at that time, uh, not surprisingly to you, having watched these things, some folks said, we didn't want to spend a dime on the Russians. Let them go bankrupt. Let the worst happen. They said, well, hang on here. Uh, you know, we have an opportunity to work with them, cooperative threat reduction, mm -hmm. to take down these missiles, to take off the warheads, to get the nerve gas under control. And they said, well, that's their problem. Let them pay for it. We've got problems. In, in, I can hear that. the speeches. And there were years where the appropriation bill, and I had to tend to this after Sam left every year, um, uh, some of them were, were stymied by about 15 different amendments that said they've got to do this, 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 and this before we spend a dime. We went through one whole year one time without being able to spend a dime because of objections on the Senate floor. So it was never a lay down hand. No. And even to this day, there are many people who are, are not really in favor of arms control treaties. But I would just simply say this, I believe, was historically tremendously important for our security. It was. Dick, when you gave your farewell speech on the floor of the Senate, you talked about bipartisanship and you reflected on six terms in the Senate at the time that you'd spent here and yes. the impact that it had. Re reflecting back on those years, pick out a couple of your colleagues that are the most memorable in a positive sense that you could talk about for a moment. Well, of course, Sam Nunn, my partner, still after 20 years, still are active, even though he's not on the Senate floor. But I've had really a wonderful association with Joe Biden as we went back and forth in chairmanships and ranking members and with John Kerry, likewise. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I enjoyed so much Chuck Hagel when he was sort of the next ranking Republican. We saw a lot of each other. It was very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And we've had a good relationship with Bob Corker, who's sort of number two on the Republican side presently. But I, I, I mentioned those uh, just because they, they sort of leap out. I've had some good ties with Ben Cardin on amendments that we've created uh, on various bills because he's very familiar with Europe, very much in favor of transparency around the world. Had a great relationship with Pat Leahy in agriculture. Our portraits are hanging there at the back of the agriculture hearing room uh, and hopefully will not be taken down for a while. I'm sure they won't. So as you've traveled around the world, you've met a lot of world leaders. Do any of those leap forward in your memory as particularly unusual or memorable? Well, a, a, a good number unusual, but that <laughs> will not be critical of their situations. as They tried to mine their, their own countries. I, I would just say that uh, I've, I've always been impressed with uh, the people that we've had on our side. For instance, Secretary of State George Schultz was someone who was a great mentor for me, and uh, he was helpful in guiding me to understand these leaders that I was going to seek, or back in the Reagan days and even subsequently. Uh, I've had wonderful relationships with uh, many of the Russians. They're, they're not good friends. They are people who come from a very different background altogether, but there is a mutual respect, feeling that somehow we've managed to live on the planet together. Uh, a very gracious time with many German friends. I have a German heritage with the Luger family, uh, having come from Germany. Uh, and uh, so I've always been interested in, in them and maybe uh, more cordial with their leadership. What's next? Now, when you leave the Senate, what are you going to be doing next? Well, probably a lot of things. But initially, uh, I have agreements with Indiana University and the University of Indianapolis and Georgetown University to spend uh, several days on campus, on each of those campuses, give some speeches, uh, to try to work with interns or students who come to Washington uh, with, as they try to find possibilities. Then I'm going to work with the uh, 
uh, German uh, Marshall Fund. Uh, and I, I look forward to that because uh, this will keep us in contact with diplomats, with ways in which uh, they deal with each other as well as with our country. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we have more ambitions that we'll have to see whether they work out. I would like to continue to work on what I call the Feeding the World projects, but they really come from agricultural heritage, my background in the Agriculture Committee. Um, I see lots of possibilities, a visit with Bill Gates and others who are doing great things all the way out in the field. Dick, it's been an honor serving with you in the Thank Senate. You. I Thank wish you the very best. Thank you, Dick. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dick Luger is going on to great things, I'm sure. This is not the end of his service to our country. And I wish him and Shar the very best, uh, whatever their next undertaking may be. Uh, as you receive praise from the senator from Kentucky to the south of Indiana, accept some from the senator from west of Indiana in the state of Illinois. I'm honored to count Dick Luger as a friend, and I'm sure going to miss you. You were an extraordinary ally and colleague in so many important issues.